This is the final session, and my name is Anthony Selden, and this is going to be very much a participation session. At least half of it will be about questions that you have put to this amazing panel. And what we're looking at is the most important question, how often have we heard that today, that you could possibly ask, which is about teachers. And what is it that great teachers have in common? What is the magic dust about teaching? And how can we really understand that and spread it? And you'll have ideas about that. And I'm sure that you are all, those of you who are teachers, are amazing teachers anyway. We are going to finish today at 5.45, come what may. And Chris Husbands is going to be coming onto the stage at 5.40. So we're going to be out of here all together by quarter to six on time. I am not going to spend a long time introducing the panel because you all know who they are. You've all got the literature. And I am going to call them up. I, they asked me what order I was going to call them up in. And I am going to call them up according to the colourfulness of their attire today. And there can only be one winner there. And it is Camilla Batgelich. And C C Camilla Batman-Gelich is going to come up now. And then we're going to take... I'm going to decide, uh, while Camilla is talking, uh, who is the second most colourful person. I think it's pretty obvious who is Drabist. Michael, uh, but you, I know, are going to compensate from that to the sheer brilliance of your oratory. And let's have a big hand for Camilla. Thank you very much. Uh, I've got five minutes to talk to you, so I'm going to cut to the chase. Uh, I was born very premature. Don't take a photograph of me while I'm talking because I forget what I'm saying. Uh, I was born very premature one kilogram, and uh, they didn't put me in an incubator. So I got significant damage to key areas of my brain, which affected my endocrine system, and also a lot of my learning ability. So I ended up aged 16 with a reading age of a seven-year-old, and uh, really struggling with writing. And uh, I want to begin by telling you how difficult it was to have special educational needs teaching. I was bored out of my mind. I was being asked to write Bs in the birth column of the newspaper and Ds in the death column of the newspaper. Uh, over and over again, people were doing sounds with me, trying to point out letters to me. And uh, more and more, I got disaffected until eventually, literally, I climbed out of the window with my fat butt, got on a bike and disappeared out of school, didn't want to go back to the classroom. And it wasn't until an extraordinary neurologist assessed me, uh, called McDonald Critchley, who was a specialist in uh, specific learning problems, that I was given an extraordinary chance to participate in education. And through his analysis, he transformed my educational possibility. And the way he did it was trying to find my strengths and my abilities as opposed to getting me to work through my disabilities. So by the time I'd got to him, age 16, it was decided that I would never educationally achieve. Uh, the recommendation of the local educational psychologists was that I should go to cookery school. And, um, and that was it. But McDonald Critchley made an arrangement for me to do my A-levels on tape, and then Warwick University made an arrangement for me to do my degree on tape, and then I was able to walk out of Warwick with a first-class degree. And what I learned from this experience was that the best teaching I ever received was rigorous, demanding, aspirational, and it worked on my abilities, of course I had disabilities and I continue to have those disabilities, but those disabilities uh, are things that I work around rather than lead my life through. So I think uh, for those of you who work with children who've got specific educational needs, I really recommend 
that you find the heroic and the aspirational in that child as opposed to constantly focusing on what they can't do and trying to bring them to a particular norm. Uh, I currently survive by having lots of PAs that I dictate to. I still can't use a computer or a keyboard. I can't text, but hey, I'm here. Thank you very much. And while we're talking about this, all of you please think and reflect what in your own experience, in your own lives, was the common ingredients of the truly great teaching that you had and of the truly great teachers who you witness now. Because I want by the end of this session, and we have only 52 minutes to get there, to have totally defined what this brilliance about teaching is. Now, the next one in terms to come up is going to be the top half only of her. Uh, but as we can't have the top half without the bottom half, we're going to have the whole of, uh, the whole of poet uh, Bridget Minimal. Top half. Oh, okay. Hello. <laughs> the top half of me, I think the hair has to count as well, doesn't it? Um, I'm normally a lot more colourful, but um, my, my mother called me and she was like, I've seen who you're on the panel with, look sensible for once. So I tried. <laughs> um, when I was thinking about the best teaching that I ever received, I did, as I tend to do, I wrote a poem about it. And I wrote this a couple of years ago and I tried to finish it for this. So here, here's the final product. And um, I have been very lucky that on the whole, my English teachers throughout my whole life were amazing people. And so this is called English Teachers. I learnt to write when I was three, early. Mum read to me as she was scared that I'd be disadvantaged because English wasn't her first language. Scared that I'd be left behind and so she read to me. Taught me words with many syllables that even today I still tend to say with an African accent. English life lesson number one. Some things and some words will always stay with you. And in reception, Mrs. Lynch would say to make up stories, so I did, and I was four. Armed with crayons and notebooks, I wrote, I thought things up. Thought things up and wrote them down. Thought things up and then I spread them round to everyone I knew and then felt guilty because really I knew that I was lying and mum said lies weren't good. I felt bad at first. Then Mrs. Lynch revealed that secretly lies are actually allowed when you write. Lies that people listen to. I like that. And a year later, Mrs. Greenwood taught me to write words that she could actually read because before then my handwriting was atrocious, as was the rest of the class. And so with small pens gripped in small hands, we'd all look at the blackboard and follow her lead. A, a ball with a tail. B, I can't remember. C, like a mouth. D, like B, that I can't remember, but backwards. E, like two hands held outstretched because E's in the middle of words tend to be long sounds. It wasn't easy, but she made it fun. I remember the game where we'd write the alphabet on a wall over and over and over again. Five-year-old graffiti. Over and over and over again, all week until Friday. And on Monday morning, we'd come back and the wall was painted over. We had crime without consequence, and we loved that. <laughs> and Mrs. This Was Way, it would laugh at me. I can't remember how to spell her name, which saddens me, but excusably, I haven't spelt it since I was six, and I don't know how I managed to spell Thistle's weight at six, but I still remember her laughing at me kindly. She'd look at me when she accepted that I would never do, could never do exactly what she asked me or told me to do. Once, she said that we should write about the life of a victim in World War II. I wrote a story about the journey of a ration box of vegetables from the point of view of a soon-to-be-eaten potato. <laughs> The main character was my auntie Doreen, who grew up in Blackburn in the 1940s and was the one who told me what rationing was and also how she'd wave goodbye to the vegetables on the farm when they went away to London. An English life lesson number 72. Real life stories can be just as fun. And when I was seven, Mr. White said I should write as many things as possible, so I did. I wrote fairy tales and narratives, accounts and yarns and legends. I wrote chronicles and anecdotes and rumors, lies and truths, and he told me to keep on going. 
And Miss Mack was my teacher twice, year four and year six. She taught me on either side of Mrs. Rico, who was nice, but instantly forgettable and not really worth a verse and a poem when we compare her to Miss Mack, who was amazing, because Miss Mack was a storyteller. The boy in the story was called Jock, and he was South African like she was, and was always getting into trouble in ways that simultaneously and somewhat subliminally would teach my class of South East London 10-year-olds what happened in the times of apartheid. We'd get a chapter once a week, often on Fridays, sometimes twice a week if we were particularly good, which was not often. We'd listen, captivated, waiting for the end of a story that didn't have one. An English Live Lesson one, number 193, keep your audience wanting more. If they like it, continue, but try to never outstay your welcome. And secondary school was interesting. I wrote more at age 11 than when Mr. Smith was teaching me English than at any other time that I've been writing since. He taught me my favorite word, archipelago. Archipelago. He said it meant a group of islands, that it reminded him that we were always better together, always better with company and never at our best alone because if the epitome, he taught me that word too, of solitude, an island, had a word that meant many of them, a word that meant plural, what hope do we have as human beings if we were alone? And that was English Live Lesson number 317, I think. Words are powerful things and teachers have great power. And Miss McEwen was my year eight English teacher. One day I gave her a story. She hadn't asked for it. Ozymandias. And while I've always been good at remembering things, remembering stories, I, can never, I never can when I haven't really wanted to. I tried, but the night before when I knew that I wouldn't, I couldn't remember it all, I thought I'd write her a story instead. I based it on a poem, on that poem. Travelers in antique lands, vast and trunkless legs of stone, kings of kings. I wrote a story about the poem she asked me to learn and gave it to her. And she read it but didn't say anything. Next lesson, she asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, and I replied, a writer or an archaeologist. But because I don't really like dirt, most probably a writer. <laughs> I reckon it'll be a bit easier, I said, and they tend to make a lot more money. <laughs> she looked at me and told me, but you can't write about what you write about, Bridget. You write the wrong type of things, Bridget. You have to do your homework properly, Bridget, before you can claim to write and I did everything properly for a year and a half. No more fairy tales or narratives, accounts, no yarns or legends, no more anecdotes or chronicles, no rumors, lies or truths. I didn't write anything else for a year and a half after. And Miss Indico was the next one. It took us a while, year nine, years nine, 10 and 11. And at some point, I'm not sure when, I started to write again. She read one of the stories I gave her told me it wasn't quite what she asked for, to do it right the next time, but sometimes surprises are a good thing. We had a deal. If I sent her the set work, I could then send her a story, and she'd mark them both, and I'd always do better in the creative stuff. And I reckon that's the last English life lesson I wrote, I learned. Some things will stick with you forever. Thank you very much. Fantastic. And now Professor Celia Hoyles of this parish. And Celia is just, uh, by come forward, Celia, is just ahead of Michael. I thought we'd lost Michael then. I thought he was so pissed off by me saying he was going to be last. He, he's, he was just going to bid in the whole session. Celia. Slightly unfortunate use of the word pissed there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm glad I'm not bottom in the brightness sakes. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, I feel quite nervous after these two brilliant presentations. And I'm from mathematics and I'm a mathematician. So I thought, how can I be engaging at this end of this long day? And um, all my life as a professional, I've tried to make maths more interesting. And I want to just try and relate that to what I think is what best pe teachers share. And so being an academic, I did a lot of reading. I did a little survey with my colleagues here at the Institute of Education and also some of the best math teachers I know who I work with. And so I, I analyzed this survey. I don't think it's terribly rigorous. But it was very soon that I think some of the ingredients that I think were well illustrated in the talks we've heard just now and earlier, and these they are. Uh, first of all, to be respectful and attentive relationships and always a bit of humor. Secondly, constantly seeking ways to empower learners to learn, constantly striving to do better, 
high expectation and appreciations of different ways to learn and different trajectories. An atmosphere in their teaching that encourages conjecture, learning from each other, collaboration, and making connections. That's particularly important in my subject. It's not just one way, you have to make connections. And now I want to dwell on something that I think is so important, at least in, for me, and that's actually excellent subject knowledge. So teaching can provide a glimpse of what the subject is about. We've talked a lot about English and how you can understand what English is about by reading books and also you know, by practicing your grammar or whatever. In the same thing with music, you can practice your scales, but you need to be able to hear the symphony. In mathematics, you've got to be able to see what the point of it is, rather than only just learn all the techniques. And this is what I think is the real, really good teachers do. They make sure everyone has the grounding, but they give a glimpse of the horizon. And now I'm, uh, I have this spectre of my director, Professor Chris Husbands, who said to me, Celia, this is not a conference. This is a festival. So I'm not going to do any more PowerPoints. And I'm going to show a little bit of a video where I want you to do a bit of maths with me. This is actually uh, about, it was a uh, tiny section from a television program I was involved in quite a while ago. So the first puzzle is how long ago. But basically the idea of it, which I think is so crucial, and it's about what teachers try to do, is to try and see why we're learning maths. This is a very trivial example. This is not about climate change or important issues. This was actually just playing games and solving puzzles. But basically, uh, the, the, the thing about fun and games, we had a, um, a song that I'm going to play to you. And those are the words that you'll just hear. Is, uh, the song goes, life can be a puzzle, and that's what makes it fun. Apply some mathematics and find out how it's done. And so much of mathematics is underlying. And if you only just thought a little mathematically, you could understand how it's done. So that was the big idea. The trivial game is a game of playing popping balloons. That's what I just want to show you. So here we have two teams. We have men against women and 11 balloons. Men against women adds a sort of free song or sort of competition. <laughs> and the, these are the rules of the game. Because in mathematics, there's always rules. Uh, these are just made up rules, but in mathematics, obviously, they relate to the subject. And you can either pop one balloon, or you can pop two balloons if they're next together. And basically, you've got to have to know who wins. Uh, so you can pop one, or you can pop two. And the team who pops the last balloon wins. Now, this was a game we did on television, prime time. We had about 10 million viewers, and everyone quite enjoyed it. And I'm just going to show you halfway through, because I'm very concerned about time. And I just want you to just think what you would have done. You've got to think mathematically and not be random. And I haven't got time to start from the beginning when there are 11. There's going to be, we're starting when there are, in fact, only six balloons. Um, hopefully, it's number one. Number one? Yeah. Shall we? This is the women's one. turn. Right. We we'll just take one, number four. We we'll just take number four. Oh. Are you oh, sure? Don't help them. She's cheating. Don't help them. She's cheating. Don't help them. You're still taking an hour less than the women. It's all right. Can you Don't worry. Yeah. Take eight, eight, eight and nine. Eight and nine. nine. OK. All right. Eight and nine. What would you do now? <laughs> what do you say after that? Well, that's all we've got time for this week. Until next week on Fun and Games, good night. Good night. <laughs> Listen. Here's one for you until next week. You know the feeling, got up in the morning, you've got your boxer shorts inside out, over your trousers, and somebody's tied your ankles together with rope. Can you get your boxer shorts off and on again the right way round over your bottom without untying the rope? We'll give you the answer next week.
we can talk about that later. Thank you very much. Definitely one to try at home tonight. And finally, Michael Rosen. Michael, could you do that? Not, not at all. Not, no, absolutely not at all. I was once on a program that was about problem solving. I couldn't do any of them at all. Never. Uh, what was it called? Mind Games. That's right. Channel 4 program. I couldn't do any of them at all. I completely hope the set it. That I means don't believe you're it. sane. <laughs> well, no. Michael. I, I love working with my daughter, who's year seven, doing uh, maths. Good. Because right, she right. shows me how, but I'll come to that in a minute. Okay. Yeah, several glimpses. I think that's what I'll start with. But um, actually, before I do that, in one sense, like this is a lovely question for any of us to think about. Um, but in one sense, if I just address the question, uh, who were my best teachers, it's leaving out the rest of the class. So part of me wants to answer it nice and selfishly and egocentrically. And the other thing is I'm, I want to look at the other 29, or in fact, actually, when I was at primary school, there were 48 kids in my class, to wonder what the other 47 are doing. So um, I, I, I made a sort of a struggle a bit with that. So um, a few glimpses. Uh, here I am, uh, aged uh, 12, and Madame Hill, who is in fact French, uh, but she's married to an English guy, and she comes in and she says, Maître Corbeau sur un arbre perché tenait en son bec un fromage. Maître Renard par l'odeur alléchée lui tint à peu près ce langage. Maître Renard, Maître Corbeau, que vous êtes beau si votre ramage se rapporte à votre plumage. Vous êtes le phénix des hôtes des bois. I loved that. I loved it. I loved the way she did it. She was French, the rest of it. I can say I loved it. I went home and I learned Maître Corbeau uh, sur un arbre perché, the, the story of the crow and the, uh, the fox. And I went home and learned it. But in fact, some of the other kids in the class hated it. So I have a problem. I loved it. The other kids hated it. I will leave you thinking about that. Okay, uh, now let's come uh, a little bit older and Miss Pope. Claire Pope was my biology teacher and she had a principle that every single lesson she said it and it drove us all mad, but at the same time, there was a fundamental wisdom to it. She would tell us about things. She would tell us about osmosis or she would tell us about photosynthesis. And then she would say, turn to the person next to you and rephrase that in your own language, okay? And then we would then have to come back to her and say what osmosis is. If we said it with too much that was like hers, she would say, no, start again, put it in your own words, which, as you can imagine, uh, 14, 15, 16-year-olds drove us completely nuts. But she kept at it and kept at it, and by the end of the year, somehow, some of us, most of us, had a passion for biology. I did indeed, and that was a route that I took, though later sw swung back. So there's a little picture there of Miss Pope. Now let's come to the sixth form, and it's the upper sixth, and um, we're doing Milton's Comus. We have a new teacher, Mr. Spearman, and Mr. Spearman comes in and he says, it's a boys' school by now, I've, I've moved from uh, Harrowheel County Grammar School to Watford Boys Grammar School because we moved, and Mr. Spearman comes in, he says, I tell you what, boys, as they used to call us, I tell you what, boys, um, do you know, <clears throat> I know absolutely nothing about this poem. <laughs> I don't understand it at all. I wonder if, when we do it, you could explain it to me. So that's what we did. We spent uh, most of that year when we did Milton's Comus, we were also doing Antony and Cleopatra and one or two other things, um, and we explained it. I went home and told my dad. My dad used to be the prof here, so he, he, he was in education. Um, and I said, you know, Mr. Spearman said the rest of it, and my dad said, very clever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 very cunning, very cunning. No, I like that, I like that, very good, very good. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, it's a good old dodge, you know, plenty of us have done it, you know, down through the years. It's, you, you come in, you pretend you know nothing, and... Um, you know, and get the kids or the students, whatever, to, to, to tell you about it. And it's, it's, just, it's just a gag, really. It's just a hoax we do it, you know. And I thought, oh, we didn't see it. Oh, really? I, I felt a bit disappointed that Spearman, Mr. Spearman had played this trick. Twenty years later, I'm at some kind of event, and this quite elderly chap comes up to me, actually 30, 40 years later, um, and he said, oh, hello. I've always wanted to speak to you, Michael. It's wonderful to see how you're doing and so on. Do you know, I always think back to that year we did Milton's Comus, you know. I had no idea what, was it, what it was about. <laughs> Not a clue, he said. And you boys, you know, you really told me, you know. And, re and I then told him what my dad had said. And he, he, anyway, he found that quite funny. Okay, um, let's rack forward now. I'm doing an MA. 
I'm doing an MA in children's literature, and one of my teachers is Tony Watkins. Uh, look him up, he's a wonderful critic of children's literature. And um, his method of teaching was to give us uh, chunks of theory. He was doing theory of children's literature. We would do narratology, intertextuality, and so on. And he would give us psychoanalytic processes behind children's literature and behind reader response and stuff. And he would hand us wadges of stuff to read. And then we would read it, and he would then begin every one and a half hour seminar the same way, like this. So. <laughs> That was the full extent of Tony's presentations for <laughs> MA seminars. His attitude was, if you're doing an MA and you volunteer to do an MA, MA, then bloody read the stuff I'm giving you. I'm putting a lot of effort in to do it. Read it, come back, we'll have a discussion. I will join the discussion as, a, as an experienced reader and whatever. And that was how he did the whole year. On the other hand, Dennis Butts, one of the greatest critics of children's literature, do read his introduction to Alice in Wonderland um, in the o Oxford Classics, or for that matter, Children of the New Forest. And he gave us a one-hour lecture. Um, and in fact, usually it was a one and a half hour lecture and there wasn't time for a discussion. So uh, quite a lot of variation in there. I will finish with my dear dad, who at the age when I was 15 said, I don't think you should be doing Inglit in school, you should do it at home with me. Okay, and the first lesson began like this. Buffalo Bill's defunct who used to ride a water smooth silver stallion and break one, two, three, four, five pigeons just like that. Jesus, he was a handsome man. And what I wanna ask you, is where do, uh, what I want to what I want to ask is how do you like your blue-eyed boy, Mr. Death? Anyway, that was my opening of the first lesson with my dear dad, um, who uh, was American actually, though not many people knew that, um, and he was very good at American accents because he was in the American Army. Uh, I once said to my dad, uh, before you go, Father, um, have you got any advice? Um, what is your main piece of advice about anything at all in life? And he said, yes, the same advice that Karl Marx gave his daughter, which is, be curious. And he said that. My dear dad uh, taught me English lit. One of the main ways he did it was to hand me a great big, very dull blue book that he got issued with when he was in the American Army uh, called Understanding Poetry by Brooks and Warren. It's the so-called new criticism method. And he said, work your way through that, lad. Um, that's how he spoke to me. Anyway, I've given you a little set of glimpses of uh, teachers who were very good to me and very kind to me and so on. I had many, many wonderful teachers but as I say, I come back to that question, what about those other kids? I, in some respects, was both simultaneously a doddle to teach, but also one of the worst possible people to teach. Both my parents were teachers. I was what in Yiddish is known as a knucker. That means a know-all know or a clever dick. And these, as you know, we are awful to teach because we think we know the answers when we don't. And of course, then we, get, we become very naughty. I broke the school detention record. So I want to put that on record now, all right? So what was going on in those classes, where any of the classes I've been in, with the kids or the students who weren't getting it. And in a sense, I think that's the greatest challenge facing anybody. My dear mother, who was also an educationist and wrote with my dad the language of primary school children for uh, Penguin Special, I think she addressed that uh, very, perhaps a little bit more so than my dad. And in that book, uh, there are some answers to that question. And both of them arrived at the fundamental tool the fundamental instrument of education is talk. That we, if you like, do not give talk the space that it deserves and the space that arrives that will guarantee understanding. And if you look at recent research by, and I'm gonna forget his name, no I haven't, it's come to me, uh, Charles Hume. He set himself the simple little problem of if you give year four and year five children the problem of how do you improve comprehension according to the kinds of tests we give children on comprehension, two methods, give them more phonics or let them talk. And guess what? Outscored give them more phonics by many, many, many marks on whatever statistical method you used, it was talk. So it's Dr. Charles Hume, a great fan of phonics, let it be said, so I'm not picking one of my guys, I'm picking one of the phonics guys, and talk. Talk is the great instrument for understanding, comprehension, and discovery. That's, I believe, fundamentally what we have to put in education. It's what both my parents believed in and even actually occasionally allowed me to do. Thank you very much. Thank you much. Thank you, Michael, very much. Now, we don't have very long now. We have to get to this elixir of what this uh, 
Uh, great teaching, common elements all are. We've got some 25 minutes to do it. Let's come over to your questions. I'm just going to summarize uh, here. Camilla uh, said many things, but uh, the magic ingredients, common ingredients is something about being rigorous, but also about concentrating on the positives, not looking at what people can't do, what they can do. For Bridget, inspiration was clearly very important and a lot of the word archipelago. For Celia, I talked a lot about respectful and working out how you get uh, boxes over tied ankles. And for Michael, <laughs> words, be curious, so, and no. Claire Pope. Did you quite fancy Claire Pope? Uh, no, I, I didn't. She was, yeah, yeah, come on. No, no, I promise I didn't fancy Claire Pope. But she did say, put it in your own words. She did. You just put it in your own words. We're not going to put it in your words. Uh, so let's have the first question, or the first uh, statement of uh, what the right answer is. Over to everybody. Someone in the front row here. And if the next person put their, puts their hands up, we can get a mic to you. Do we have a, a second one at the moment? Let's go with the first one. Hang on, we don't have the mic, we don't have the sound on yet. No, no. Click the bottom. Uh, the, is there a, thank you very much. Is there a yellow mic? There is, we have a yellow mic, but, but try that. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, no, yeah. Yes, I think unanimously over the many years I've taught, uh, the response from students is, we know you love teaching. And that's simply it, that they can see teachers who have a passion, and they, are, they can forgive things, but they want to know you're enjoying it. And I think that is the most important thing, and it's not necessary to do with te technical knowledge or loads of th um, teaching theory. It's they want to know that you're enjoying it. So, uh, comments, anyone there, about the importance of the teacher loving it? Uh, and, and anyone on that? Anyone disagree with it? I um, think it's really important that you love it, but I don't think you can love it all the time. And what is it that you love? I think partly you love the whole joy of uh, showing you know, what you're teaching and seeing the light bulb uh, go on you know, amongst the learners. But I also think you love trying to struggle to try and understand what their problems are. I think that's actually, sometimes it's very, very hard. I'm sure you yeah, recognize me. Yeah. How do you keep the love there? Easy, perhaps, when you first yeah. year in teaching. How do you keep it in your 37th year? Uh, the, 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 the questioner says she's been blessed with wonderful students. Do you still love teaching as much as you did when you... And how many others love teaching now every bit as much as they did in, in the first year? And how many are finding it hard to keep that same intensity? We have a lot of lover, lovers of teachers here. Thank you very much indeed. So that's certainly a, a core ingredient. Could I um, just so yeah, just one thing? Absolutely. That, that one of the common elements between us was belief. That if you believe in the students and then that you find that transformational, then you have the love of doing it. I teach uh, various ways in different places, uh, including MAs and so on. And if I found that the transformational thing is the belief in the people who don't believe in themselves, that part of education, sadly, does create people who come out some of whom do not believe in themselves. And I found that the moment, I mean, you know, we call it Eureka moment or whatever, but when teachers believed in me, I gave them loads of stuff. And then I found myself as teaching that when I've believed, particularly in people who don't believe in themselves, there's that transformational moment. And I found that incredibly satisfying professionally and I've loved my job. So I don't know, and everybody seems to have said that um, in one way or another, that you, you must believe that people can do things but also the ones who don't look like they can do it. You've got to go on believing it, so you've got to give the signal to the person who thinks, I'm crap, I'm rubbish, I'm no good, I'm going to be passive, I'm not going to do anything. So, you know, my first response to those balloon things is, ah, <laughs> don't show me. But if a teacher says, no, go on, give it a go, try. My daughter is my teacher with maths, she keeps believing in me. I keep saying, no, I can't do it. And she says, yes, Dad, you can. The balloons weren't it, important. It was the idea of looking at them in a mathematical way, Michael. I mean, really. No, I got that. No, I wasn't <laughs> afraid of the balloons. It's all right. I did get that. Did Steady that. on, you two. <laughs> Thanks for believing in me. <laughs> and gentlemen here. Yep. Um, yes, I'm one of the old ones, I'm afraid, Michael. And, um, but this no notion of love and empathy and so on, you've actually taken what I was going to say to some extent, which is actually you believe that children can. You have a belief all the time that children can do something. And if the answer is you can't do it, you can't do it yet. 
and can I help you to find a way to do it at some point? And the one thing that struggle, I've struggled with from this morning is that this notion of, yes, you can, is the idea of failure. Now, some people like the idea of failure. I quite like the idea of measuring capability because everybody is capable at some level. They may not be at the top yet, but if you show them that they've got to a certain stage, they might have a chance to move from there and get even better. And do you think we're too averse to failure in our schools? I think we make it too overt. And actually, some children go through from a very early age thinking they have failed, particularly if you have a very strong testing culture. And that then becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy? Inevitably. It can't do anything but, because okay. parents pick up on failure, and they reinforce that in the wrong households. And we are what we believe ourselves to be. Absolutely. Okay, uh, let's, yes. Um, like to, off that point, I think instead of focusing more on what everyone can, that everyone is capable in some way, I'd like to instead focus, I, I, I'm quite comfortable with the idea of failure, but you don't fail at everything all the time. And so for me, when I was in school, numbers, I can't do numbers, I can't do maths, and my, it, it's, it's, a, it's a struggle to this day. I, I'm sorry. And no, for no. words I could do. And so if I did, I actually have a maths version of that poem, and it's very, very, very different. Because, and oh, I think no. the fact, I, I loved my English teachers, but I think a big part of that is because I wanted to learn about words. I loved English. And I think, I was, I, and I'm happy now, and I was happy then to be like, I'm not the best at maths, I'm not really fussed, but I can do this. And I think we need to, more, we need to be more, we need to be more willing to say, you know what, you're not gonna be the best at this, but you can do this. And instead of just accepting that all children have to be good at maths, English, and science, and you all have to be good at all three of them, which some children are, I think it's more important to be like, you're really good at English, bit all right at maths, terrible at science, and amazing at sport. For example, do you think, Bridget, that we should let children give up maths at say 14 if they really hate it and, and let them concentrate more on things that they love? Well, no, because you do need maths in your life. But I, not that my GCSE maths, I found my old coursework when I was moving into my new flat, and none of it is relevant. And I'm sorry, a lot of it I didn't understand, I, 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 I haven't found any relevance in it. What I would like instead is when I go into a shop for everyone in the shop, if I say if it something costs. Eight pounds seventy-two, and I give them ten pounds seventy-two for them not to look completely baffled because they don't know that they I, I, they can just give me a two-pound coin back. I think it's basic life less life skills like that which are more important. Which so, for some reason we're not some for some reason a lot of children aren't learning, but instead they're learning a lot more complicated things. So ce yeah, okay. So Celia, how about that? Mass could be more relevant, and then it would spark more children. Well. Yes, I mean, maths can be more relevant. I mean, I really, I, I'm very glad I did this silly thing with these balloons, or indeed the boxer shorts, because that is not the important thing about it. The important thing is the way you approach that problem. Yeah. And I, so that's why I always cringe a little bit about relevance, because it's not that, because if it means you leave school and you never ever come across that particular situation, you say, well, my schooling was irrelevant. What you do need is to have a way of approaching that situation based on all your education in school. So I would hope, actually, balloon popping <laughs> is probably not the best example, but actually that to, to solve those problems, you need to think symmetrically. Okay. And that's okay. a really powerful way of thinking. It's not the particular issue, it's looking through it. And, okay, we're, we're looking at what the common ingredients of great teachers are. Yeah. Um, I'm not a teacher. I work with um, parents and with children, particularly who've experienced trauma. Um, the thing that really makes a difference and made a difference to me as a child was going into school and being shown kindness. Yeah. Um, because I often went in with a lot of emotional needs that I wasn't getting met. They weren't being met at home. Um, so I couldn't concentrate on my education. And when I was in primary school, some of those emotional needs got met. I was shown kindness, particularly by one teacher I can remember who just, she spent more time talking to us. <laughs> Um, and playing the guitar with us and teaching us funny songs. Um, when I went to senior school, I didn't get any of my emotional needs met. And, um, any of I, your emotional needs met? No, no. none. And um, I did not do well at senior school, and not, not emotionally, um, you know, I ended up being quite ill emotionally, but also academically, I didn't achieve at all. So what are teachers like when they're kind compared to teachers who are not kind? Um, they really talk to you. As a child, they really engage with you. I mean, I, I, you know, it must be incredibly hard for teachers nowadays because they're under so much pressure to deliver, 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 deliver. 
So I think it's at a much higher level. And um, we've been talking about there being time to talk and time for children. You know, th that's what okay. all teachers, I'm sure, want. Um, so that's what needs to change, in my opinion. So thoughts there from any of the panel? Camilla, so, uh, kindness? Uh, yeah, I think actually, currently, this is a big problem in uh, educational philosophy in this country, in the sense that uh, ministers, government thinkers are hugely underestimating the influence of poor psychosocial care conditions uh, with which children come into school. So attainment is always thought about in terms of skills acquisition, but actually, in order to have really good attainment, you have to be able to regulate your emotion and your energy. You have to manage your energy too. And children who are constantly frightened get dysregulated in their ability to manage emotion and energy. And the reason kindness is so important is because literally the soothing, calming, attentive attention of a good teacher can regulate the physiological and neurological functioning of a disturbed child so that the child can actually calm down sufficiently to take the educational uh, moment in. And I really feel that, uh, much respect to him, Michael Gove has a blind spot in this area. Uh, and it needs to be addressed. There isn't enough conversation about uh, social and emotional needs of children in education at the moment. Um. Camilla, can we teach teachers to be kind and how can we help them to find the inner acceptance within themselves, the inner love, so that they can then uh, just ripple out love to others and kindness? Michael, coming in a second. So, so just, Camilla, Camilla, then Michael. Yeah, just very quickly, okay. at the moment we do the opposite. That's to say we give teachers... Um, or we tell many teachers, government tells teachers, to do something called behaviour management. And you have smiley face systems and traffic lights. So in a way, you're under instruction to do the very opposite of what Camilla is saying, which is to regulate the children's behaviour through forms of competition, no matter how supposedly affirmative it is. It's not even positive reinforcement for all the kids who aren't being positively reinforced. So even according to behaviourism, Right? At least 15 of the kids are failing that piece, so they're getting negative reinforcement. And so they sit there on the wrong color light or with not enough smiley faces, but being, having, their management, but having their behavior managed in a negative way. And this is a dominant mode of behavior management in primary schools, which is a form of negative reinforcement if you use a behaviorist model. And no matter how kind a teacher is, and no matter how wanting to believe in the children, there is a tangible thing going on in the classroom which means lack of belief. It's saying compete with each other and get yourself positively reinforced. It's exactly the opposite. And if you, if you then couple that with this uh, linguistic deficit theory and cultural deficit theory which prevails in the air at the moment that the kids are in fact coming to school grunting these days and anyway they haven't got any culture, that if you marry the things up together no matter how kind and willing you might want to be, you have these three dominant things over you, so your kindness is in fact being blocked by behaviour management, linguistic deficit theory and cultural deficit theory. It may not be called that at any moment, but that's the prevailing theory that's going on behind the practice. So, so those are unhelpful um, policies uh, uh, and, and procedures in the classroom, uh, and sometimes government enforced, sometimes head or principal enforced. Uh, Camilla, can, can we just come back and look at this question about can you encourage emotional intelligence in teachers? Can, you, can we encourage kindness within teachers if it's not innate within them in the first place? Uh, I'd like to address two things here. First of all, uh, for something to function really well, you've got to have an intelligent theoretical model. Uh, sanctions and rewards work well with children who've got an ordered thinking mechanism, i.e. they're calm enough 
to remember the negative stimulus of a punishment, to be able to call upon that memory the next time they're going to do something bad to stop themselves from doing the bad thing because they don't want to be punished like they were before. Whereas with children who are emotionally <coughs> dysregulated, actually, A, they're not calm enough to stop themselves and do the thinking to remember the sanctions that had been administered to them. The second thing is that actually their memories uh, hold on much more to disturbed, noxious stimulus. So a mild sanction of a detention isn't powerful enough for them to hold on in their memory to use in order to modify their behavior. And it's our propensity to use exactly the same theoretical model that is functional for functional people across a range of individuals that makes us operate sometimes in a very flawed way. And with some children, we'll succeed, and we think the model is really good. But with those we don't succeed, we think the child is bad. That's right. And I think that's, that's right. where we go wrong. And the second thing in terms of kindness is that I firmly believe that kindness cannot be didactically taught. It's experientially absorbed. Very good. And in an institution, if you want teachers to be kind to the children, the management has to be kind to the teachers. Great. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Uh, amazing discussion. I'm going to move on to, to, to someone with the scarf on. Ty? This is following on from your very last point about how to have teachers that are kind, we need the teachers to be in a frame of mind in which they can be kind. And in fact, uh, Anthony is, has got a card up his sleeve because he's, t t he's talking next week at a conference on empathy and compassion in society, which is about how exactly teachers can cultivate these tools to become more present and more empathic and kind in the classroom. Perhaps, um, yeah. Okay, and, and I think that the leadership of schools is really important, and if, if uh, the, the leaders of schools, their dominant, whatever they think they're doing, if the dominant impression they're giving everybody else is fear, fear of failure, fear of not making this target, um, the, the, and the lack of trust all around, if they don't trust people, then it just permeates everything. And one has to, to it, it's much easier if, if you have a, a wise leadership who themselves model and personify and live a, a, a kindness to others. And, and I, you know, we can change. We can change our schools and colleges. Right, okay, someone here. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just ask, because we're out of, we're going to be out of time shortly, I'm going to ask everyone who's just got a point of view, provided there are not too many, just to say something and then to ask the panel just to uh, absorb that and to make a final comment. So, um, so someone, yeah, yeah. And then somebody next. Hi, I teach in a uh, school for children with social, emotional, and behavioral difficulties. And I ask them every year at the end of the year, what could I do better next year? And, or what is it that I did well, what could I do better? And the thing that every single year they say that I do well, which is what we're discussing is how to be better, good, is, um, is um, fairness. If a teacher's fair, fair. they believe yeah. everything about them. So um, I just feel that's really important. Okay, th thank you for that. And, yep, and other hands up, anyone? Uh, some, somebody at the back. Anybody else just who might want to? So we've got somebody, preferably people who haven't spoken before, just because of the time. Um, if you have spoken before, then uh, uh, otherwise they're two towards the back, and that's that's a knit. Yep, go ahead, please. Uh, uh, the question kind of draws, sort of draws attention to to capacities of individuals, the qualities of individual teachers. But we've begun to touch on kind of what the bigger school culture, how that can affect how they do their jobs, and also potentially structures and something as simple as changing timetables to allow teachers to spend more time with yeah. particular students. So you know, you're not seeing 300 a week; you're seeing just 50 and can really get to know them. And something like that can allow them to have all this, the care, the connection, the belief in the individual students. And it's something that, that leaders can do beyond kind of uh, the, the softer sides of changing culture. Okay. 
Uh, and if you perhaps belt out, if you think you've got your voice can carry, just, just belt it out. Okay, yep, at the back. Hi, it's not actually a question, it's a comment. Um, the fact that we're talking about kindness and how to be kind to people, and yet at the beginning, Camilla made a request that no, photo, no flash photography be taken when she was speaking, and she gave her reasons. She didn't need to, but she did. And yet there's been a photographer who's taken maybe 10 flash photographs while she was speaking. So I'd like to say, well done, Camilla. I thought that was amazing. And I'd like to I say, mean, is this what we're doing in our classrooms? You know, are we completely ignoring people's requests, and are we ignoring the fact that we could take a chance to be kind and to listen to what someone is saying? Just a comment, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for making that. Uh, and final one, I'm wanting everyone to talk who wants to. This is the final question then. And was that, is there something you'd particularly like to say here? I think okay, all I want to say is that, that I don't believe in the Hayward approach either, but I do believe in a whole school policy of kindness in every aspect. Okay, so Lady there believes in a whole school policy of kindness across the school. Thank you for that comment. I'm very upset this man is being ignored. Yeah, no, we're, we're, we're getting to know. There he is. Got it now. Well done. Go ahead. No, uh, thank you to the panel for your time today. Um, I was just hoping to see what you thought of a bit of play theory, which is that um, environments in which children can develop should be child-centered and child-led. And I was wondering about what parts of that could be applied to teaching. I'm wondering if teachers could bring some of that to the classroom at all ages to bring about better development um, for children throughout their lives in education. Okay, that's fantastic. And can I just ask the panel, beginning with Michael, just to, just to sum up the, the core ingredients or any responses there in, so we can finish on time uh, in roughly max 30 seconds, one minute. I think you can we're do probably all talking about, without mentioning, a theory of learning or at least a theory of the situation in which learning can take place. So all the discussion totally right and fair about kindness, we are saying that that's, a, in Latin, a sine qua non, that you cannot have the learning taking place unless there is the kindness and the fairness. And when I was talking about the belief in the learner, it, in a sense, that's a similar thing. I'm saying that learning will not take place unless teacher believes in learner, and for that matter, the learner believes in the teacher, whatever that situation is. The problem with education at the moment, as I see it fundamentally, is that we have put on the back burner the discussion about how people learn. So we've had these crazy statements about rote learning, we've had crazy statements about what, what exams will do or won't do and how failure is terrific for us and all the rest of it, okay, but at the core argument about education should always be about how do we learn. I know my parents spent the whole of their life addressing that matter. It disappeared off the agenda once it was decided that governments could work out how people learn. They could either follow strategies or there could be enough exams in place that enough people could be bullied to take the exams and the other lot can go hang. That is the fundamental principle that hangs over education at the moment. For me, the only advances we can take in education and for you, for teaching to become great, is for teachers to take over the theory of learning. And that's to say to become researchers of their own practice and to work with people like here at the Institute of Education or any other higher education place to get back to where we should be, which is how are these people, these young people and most of it, how are they learning? How, why are some people learning in different ways? What is it I could do that would enable it or for that matter discourage it? How should that happen? And when teachers are engaged in that, in my experience, not only as a, a pupil, but also as someone who works with teachers all the time, the teaching itself gets better because people are excited and engaged with that kind of theory of their own practice. So for me, that's the fundamental thing. How and what are the best conditions for learning, and how does learning happen? And it's, it's a big mystery in some respects, but in others, plenty of people have addressed this matter over the last two or three hundred years. Uh, and, and, and Bridget, with, with a plea for kindness to, to the, everyone's getting home times. Um, well, I think the issue of fairness that came up is a very important one. For me, even all of my amazing English teachers were fantastic. We even had, I had other teachers for other subjects I liked. But if I had to choose my favourite teacher, she was a Latin and history teacher. Both subjects that, I mean, Latin I was awful at. And, and it was my old Catholic school when they said we should try and learn it. But she was fair. 
and she was fair, she wasn't excessively nice. She was very old, she'd worked in the school for 45 years, and she'd treat us all with this kind of half indifference and half, she, she, you could tell she cared. And so she'd shout, she'd shout at us, but she'd still manage to wink at us occasionally and be like, and, and we'd always make fun of her, but at the end of the day, she was a good teacher. And in terms of kindness, I'm not, look, I, and I, I mean, I'm not that far out of education. I, I don't feel like I want all my teachers to be sort of always asking how I am. And it was nice sometimes, but I don't need that from everyone. Some children do, and I think it's important to identify very quickly the children who do need that help and to make sure that they get that in their schools. But for the rest of us, I think it's less a case of constantly being kind, but a case of not being unkind. And I think that's where something goes wrong. We, I, uh, we don't need... The, the, someone before was talking about the idea of loving the job. Um, or was that... Was that yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it was someone in the front row. Right. Of, of loving, loving teaching. I think more important is that is that children know that you don't hate teaching. And I know that's quite a strong thing to make, but the one or two teachers who I've had who re you can tell. And as a child, you think if they don't like me, it's not they don't like me, they hate it. Because everything is love and hate. And I think it's more important to focus on the fact that the children can tell. And if the children can tell, they won't be receptive. You won't be receptive to them. And then it's, it, it fails on both sides. Okay. Thank you very much. And I'm going to be hated unless I can I'm going wrap to say, this up quite I'm going quickly. to say two things very, very quickly. First of all, I do think with technology now, and we saw it, uh, those of you who saw the hack first, you can give some tools to the kids to actually, so they can have a bit more ownership over their own learning. It means us as teachers actually craft the tools that we give them so they have a bit of empowerment. And this kindness thing, obviously we have to have respect and kindness, but I think if I was teaching Michael mathematics, I'd be kind of, I wouldn't bother because he says I'm no good and I hate it. I do think there's a sort of balance. Well, no, I didn't say I know. hate it. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> Okay, and um, Camilla. I want to leave you with the thought, why are donuts always round? Why can't they be triangle? <laughs> okay, so you've got the Y fronts uh, 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 over the ankles and you've got the triangular donut and just one final thought from me because I haven't said anything. To me, it, it's epitomized by a quotation I came across that you may well know from Thoreau, and this is what great teachers do. Thoreau said in the 19th century, he said that most of us lead lives of quiet desperation and go to our graves with the song still inside us, and the job of a great teacher is to release that song. Thank you, thank you, thank you everybody. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Just a couple of minutes from me. Um, what a fantastic day. Um, I hope you found it as exciting and stimulating as we wanted it to be. We had a really difficult moment. Actually, it was more like a really difficult, long, dark night of the soul about eight weeks ago when we wondered what on earth we'd done in deciding to run this. Uh, my wife, who's in the audience, said, a Saturday... A Saturday, she said, it's all right for me. I listen to you talking about education on Saturdays, but there can't be many people who'd want to. Well, what a fantastic day we've had. We've been entertained and engaged by a phenomenal range of speakers, debates and events, ideas spilling around this building, and I'm absolutely delighted. I do want to thank everybody who's made today possible. The IOE and the Times Z are delighted to have been able to work so closely with BISA, with Osiris, with the NAHT, with our media partners, the I newspaper, and with our partners, ARC, Nesta, Teaching Leaders, Beera, Bristol University, Sir John Cass Foundation, and the Mayor of London, as well as with all the others who've supported us in kind. I had to phone up some head teachers on Tuesday to say, if something goes wrong, will you step in? Within five minutes, all three of them had written, had phoned me back to say they'd be delighted. Really grateful. This is a non-profit event, and any surplus will be ploughed into next year's LFE. I also want to thank Sukla. I want to thank my colleagues at the IOE, who've been fantastic, and at the Times Ed, who've worked tirelessly to deliver the event today. And I'd like to thank Anthony Selden, who's been unstintingly generous in sharing expertise from the very different but complimentary Wellington Festival in the summer. I also want to thank our speakers, all of them. 
As Mike Shaw said this morning, we haven't paid any of our speakers or contributors. We are incredibly grateful to everybody who's contributed some really memorable events. Thank you, thank you very much. But most of all, I want to thank you. You've made the event today. You've created the buzz, you've participated, you've been here, you've contributed ideas, you've made this a lively, exciting, edgy celebration and examination of education, education in this fantastic, diverse city and education beyond it. Audience is diverse, the ideas diverse, the issues diverse, and we are delighted that so many of you have joined us to think together about the future of education. And I can go home and say to Nikki that there are people who want to listen to me talking about education on a Saturday. We're nearly finished, we're nearly finished, but not quite, not quite. We do hope you'll grab a drink from the bar and come and join us in the performance space to hear Ghouls, a great gypsy punk band, play out the first London Festival of Education. Thanks very much. See you next year.